This is Cheyenne Miller with another Psychological and Brain Sciences Department podcast. Today I'm here with Dr. Brian Anderson, a cognitive neuroscientist and professor here at Texas A&M. So how did you get involved in psychology? I was always interested in perception for as long as I can remember, even when I was a little kid. Now, obviously, my understanding of it was much more naive then, but the, the question of how two people can sort of walk into a room and take something different away or have a different description of the events that kind of happened in front of them was always something that intrigued me, and, and especially how that can sort of go awry and lead people to errant conclusions or sort of... Uh, feelings about about their world that are really difficult to support you know when people feel like irrationally sad when good things happen to them you know, how, how do you not see all the good things that are happening to you and you only seem to to think about and remember and talk about the, the bad things does perception play a role in that and so i went to undergraduate um, hoping to understand both perception and psychopathology um, and sort of uh, my heart really got stolen by the perception side of things, especially in graduate school, and I kind of chose that as the, the direction I ultimately took from the, from the two. Awesome. So what classes do you teach here at a and Well, I currently teach sensation and perception. I've taught that one a lot of times. It's kind of my bread and butter course. Right. Um, and I've also taught a graduate class on the cognitive neuroscience of attention. Oh, cool. Nice. So how would you describe your teaching style? It really differs by the class. So I think you need a very different teaching style for undergraduates, an lecture style course, um, and you need a very different teaching style for a seminar style course, which was the, the graduate course. I mean, you can teach seminars at the undergraduate level too. Um, and so for the, the lecture style courses, I, I like to try to make my lectures dynamic, kind of high energy, sort of grab students' attention and really kind of get them to be intrigued. So I ask a lot of questions where they start to really kind of think about difficult concepts and how they're going to map that onto the concepts that you're going to talk about. So try to really inspire people's curiosity, very kind of dynamic, high energy, engaging. Um, seminars, on the other hand, um, very Socratic. So I, I probably, I mean, to the nth degree, I ask more questions than anything else. Probably 80% of everything I say is a question. And my goal in the seminar is to really kind of break people down a little bit, like really kind of challenge people. And no matter what kind of answer they give me, even if I think it's a spectacular answer, I'll, I'll tell them why it might be wrong and challenge them on it just to kind of get them to think. So, yeah. That's interesting. So what is your philosophy of teaching whenever you teach these courses? Oh, well, that's a deep question. I only <laughs> scrapped the surface on that one. Um, uh, well, one of the, the cornerstones of my philosophy, particularly for lecture style classes um, is that teaching has to start with inspiration because if you can't grab somebody's attention, if you can't kind of latch onto their curiosity, they're gonna have a really difficult time remembering much of anything. Right. And even if they do a good job of remembering it for the test, then they're not gonna actually use that knowledge when they leave the course. And so I kind of start with trying to, to pique the curiosity of my students, really kind of inspire them, grab their inspiration and then apply that to the material. So could you tell us about your teaching experiences? So I first taught a class when I was a graduate student, and it's kind of where you get your, your hands and feet kind of wet there. Right. And, uh, you know, there were some definite things I wanted to do differently. No one, uh, it, it's surprising how when you're an education major, you study how to teach. Right. Um, when you're just about any other major, you really don't. And then they just kind of stick you in a classroom and say, good luck to you. Um, and hope that all the knowledge that you've gained will just naturally come out of you as a good instructor. Um, and so for me, that was not the case. <laughs> um, and through a lot of kind of trial and error, as both starting as a graduate student. And then to be perfectly honest, you know, my first semester as a professor here at AM, I didn't have all of that much teaching experience. And I learned a lot from that semester. And you can kind of see that reflected in the instructor ratings. They, you know, improved quite a bit. Yeah. You know, the first couple semesters. And then by the third semester, I feel like I was hitting a stride. And then, you know, by the fifth semester, it was kind of, you know, peaked at where I really wanted to be. Right. So your um those evaluations really help you kind of shape the way you teach 
especially early on, because I, I even had a, a period toward the beginning of one of the classes toward the end um, where I, I just asked all the students, all right, like, tell me what you really didn't like about this course. <laughs> um, be honest, you know, and I, I had a, a nice rapport with them up to that point that I, I feel like a lot of students are comfortable being honest. And then they really kind of helped me figure out like, oh, okay, this part didn't work so well, like this part didn't uh, go over as I was hoping it would. Right. And I could then kind of change those up until I got most things to something I was, you know, I liked and at least comfortable with. Right. That's good to know, because I think a lot of students don't really take the evals very seriously. And so I think having your input on that would really help people realize that they're actually important. Yeah, I pulled up a chair and kind of stuck it in front of a little <laughs> room. So it was like me on a little chair, you know, no table in front. It's kind of like, let's do some tabletop kind of thing. You know? it, was, it was great. So if you could teach any course you wanted, what would it be and why? Oh, I'm biased to say sensation and perception because right. I've, uh, and it's not just because I've taught it for so long, I chose to teach it because it's kind of at the core of, of what I study and what I'm passionate about. Um, but if I had to kind of, you know, pick a pet course that I would create from scratch, I've always been interested in teaching a course on how to break habits because that's part of what I study as well. And that's really tangible. You know, one of the projects could sort of be, all right, like pick a habit you want to break and throughout the course, we'll talk about the research that goes into understanding how habits work and different mechanisms and approaches that may be useful for overcoming them. And then kind of see like, okay, at the end of the semester, how successful were we as a class? Sort of uh, science meets practice. So uh, that might be fun. That would be awesome. I'd take that course. I don't know why habits I need to break. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So can you tell us a little about your research interests and how they relate to the article we wrote your interest piece over? Right. So my research, and this gets back to that question that I kind of had as, as a little kid, a sort of uh, fundamentally framed around the idea of, okay, when you, when you walk into a room, what do you pay attention to? There's so much in that space, if it's dense in that space, um, that you could pay attention to literally sometimes one of a hundred different things. So what do you focus on? And why? And in my research, I focus particularly on how your your learning history influences what you pay attention to. So all the different kinds of experiences that you've had in your past, how does that change the way that you direct your attention when you see different scenes and objects in the future? Um, and with respect to the, the article that was chosen for this piece, uh, that was in the context of punishment learning. So there's a lot of theories out there in terms of why, why do people tend to pay attention to things that are threatening? Um, is it because they just kind of want to know, you know, what else are they, they're intentionally monitoring for the threat, kind of looking out for it? Um, is it due to their emotional state? And there's all these different kinds of possibilities. Um, what that research was really trying to address was, okay, is this something that people really have some measure of control over? Or is your brain wired in such a way that you literally can't help but direct your attention to something that you've learned is threatening. Um, and the way that we kind of set that up is we set up an experiment where looking at the threatening stimulus actually caused the very thing that you were afraid of. If you looked at it, we, we shocked you. Right. And so you would think logically, well, if you don't like getting shocked, which nobody does that I've ever met uh, in my experiments, well then, you know, don't look at it, right? right? It, that's the logical thing to do. The, the shock should extinguish the looking behavior, but it turns out that not only does that shock not extinguish the looking behavior, it actually perpetuates it. It makes it stronger um, because it really does seem to be the case that when you learn something predicts a threat, you, you literally can't help but kind of look out for it. And that's presumably how your brain's wired to, to monitor for possible threats so that you don't miss it. And when you see it, you can kind of figure out how you want to respond to it. I really enjoyed reading that paper, by the way. And it was very well written where I could read it and I could understand what was happening. And so I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> so can you tell us how your research has influenced your teaching and in what ways have you been able to bring the insights of your research to your courses? Well, the research that you do in a lab gives you a, a tremendous amount of insight into what it is that you're talking about, particularly when you teach on exactly what you research. And so for me, that, that one's a no-brainer. I mean, I teach sensation and perception, and vision and attention is a huge, they're, they're both huge components of sensation and perception. And so I know a lot more about those than I ever would if I wasn't doing that kind of research. And so not only does that allow me to, to teach it at a much, you know, finer grain 
level, but I can also kind of speak to, okay, like how do scientists come to these conclusions when your textbook says, okay, this is the way this process works. Well, how do we know that? What do we have that we found in a research setting that would lead us to, to make that conclusion? And then to try to help these students kind of understand how they can go about evaluating that evidence in the textbook rather than just kind of taking it at face value. So how do you stay caught up in the literature in your field of study? Well, eh, maybe I'm admitting too much on this one, but you know, with, with modern technology, I mean, it's easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can set up these automated searches for different kinds of research topics, all the different papers that cite your work and talk about you. You know, you just get these automatic email feeds that kind of give you all the citations. Right. And so I, I automate a lot of that, kind of do keyword searches that are automated and just kind of email me, you know, articles and uh, monitor for articles that cite my own work to kind of see what other people are saying about it, you know, if they're extending it, discovering something new that's related to it, you know, or, or perhaps critiquing it in, in a way that I need to you know, figure out what I want to do to respond to. Yeah, nice. So how do you involve graduate or undergraduate students in your research? So at the graduate student level, a lot of my projects have a graduate student who is kind of the primary uh, project leader for that one. And so I'm sort of the, the idea architect, you know, behind the scenes, but the, the graduate students are the ones who uh, conduct the research, they analyze the data, um, and they oftentimes write the first draft of the manuscript. And okay. as they gain independence and as they learn in the lab and they start to come up with their own research ideas and we kind of hash that out together. And so I, I, give under, I give graduate students a lot of autonomy in my lab. Um, undergraduate students um, are tremendously influential when it comes to executing experiment protocols. So they do a lot of our data collection with us. We have, I think, like 12 undergraduates on the team right now because we have a lot of projects. And uh, they help with data analysis as well. And then a couple of undergrads that over the, the few years that I've been here um, have been involved and invested enough that they came up with an independent project. And working on on that um, some of them present their work at student research week and a small number of students undergraduates actually go on to present research at an international conference oh wow that's awesome so thank you so much for joining me today dr anderson we will be back with another interesting insight into the faculty of the psychological and brain sciences department